Hey, my name is Connor Herndon. I'm uh, from the Society of Physics Students at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and I'm here to tell you about Lagrangians. So, so these things are, are wonderful, majestic creatures, and unfortunately you don't discover them or, or maybe see them for the first time until you're about halfway or three quarters through a physics degree, at which point you are just this bitter shell of a human being uh, who's already had to trudge through Newtonian mechanics. So Lagrangians are this, these beautiful creatures because they require so much less work to actually get to the same answer. So hopefully this video will be able to show you how wonderful they are, give you a few terms that you can use to, to look up in your own research, and uh, maybe give a few examples to explain how, how wonderful and easy these things are to use. So Lagrangians are these functions that map something known as the uh, tangent bundle onto the real line. So that's just something for you to look up if you're interested, but this would be configuration space, this is the tangent to the configuration space, and that's mapped onto the real line. So what this means is that the Lagrangian is a function of the variables of position designated by q, i, that's the index i of the, of the position, q dot, the time derivative of that position, and then possibly of time itself. And when you use Lagrangian mechanics, you end up getting uh, in second order differential equations where n is the number of coordinates that you use to describe your system. To arrive at these equations of motion, the differential equations, you need an assumption, a, a principle, and this would be Hamilton's principle. So first we define something known as the actions. This action is something known as a functional. It's, it's a function that takes in an argument which is itself a function. So the action is defined as being the integral of the Lagrangian over time. So Hamilton's principle states that for the actual motion of the system, this, this integral will be stationary. And what that means is that it's going to be an extremum. To find the extremum of a functional, you'll need something known as calculus of variations. This has to do with uh, finding the differences between paths themselves rather than the trajectory on the path. So to minimize this integral, you do a bunch of fancy things, and you end up with something called the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now this is, uh, this is very simple, but this is the way to solve Everything you've ever known and loved. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. This will give you the equations of motion for the system if you know you're a Lagrangian. And you just take these partial derivatives and this full derivative, and then you have what you need. Now, with this Euler-Lagrange equation, you can actually derive what you would have done through just regular force laws. So uh, if you've done this correctly and you define the correct Lagrangian, you can end up getting the correct force law in the end. The problem, though, is, is I haven't told you what the Lagrangian is. The Lagrangian is actually a, a very simple function to find, and basically you can think of the Lagrangian as just being the kinetic minus the potential energy. Once you've found both the kinetic and the potential energies in your problem, which is, in general, a, a much easier thing to do than finding forces, you're totally good. You can just plug the Lagrangian into the Euler-Lagrange equation and not even have to think that much. So let's try this out first with, uh, what about a spring? So for the mass spring system, we have just a regular wall here, the ground, no coefficient of friction on the ground, just frictionless. Uh, we've got a spring here attached to the mass. So the spring has a constant k, the mass is mass m, and we're going to define our zero to be right here at the equilibrium point of the spring, and this is going to be the positive x direction. So with this, we can derive a very quick Lagrangian uh, because we know the kinetic energy is just going to be one-half m x dot squared, where x dot is the velocity, one-half mv squared. And the potential energy is going to be one-half k x squared because that's the potential energy of something on a, a spring. So that means that our Lagrangian is just going to be the kinetic minus the potential energy, which gives us a Lagrangian 1 half mx dot squared minus kx squared. So now we can plug this in to the Euler-Lagrange equation and get some equations of motion. So first we know that the, the partial of the Lagrangian on the velocity x dot is just going to be mx dot, and then the time derivative of that is just going to be mx double dot, since we're going to assume that the mass isn't changing because this is not a terrible world. Next we have our partial of our Lagrangian with respect to our coordinate x, and that's just minus kx. You can just do the math yourself if you don't believe me. So by the Euler-Lagrange equation, we say that these two quantities are equal to each other. 
mx double dot equals minus kx. So if you look real closely here, you'll see that this is actually just a force. This is mass times the second derivative of position, that's an acceleration. So this is force equals minus kx. That would be Hooke's law. So we know that force is equal to minus kx. So you can see that just starting with pure energies, just pure scalar quantity, we can actually derive all the way up to the force law. Now this is really easy in this situation because we already knew at the start that Hooke's law exists, that's a thing, and it makes us real happy when we can use it. But in other situations, it's just as easy to derive much more complicated systems with the same tactics. All you have to do is just derive your kinetic energy, uh, your potential energy, plug it in blindly, turn the crank, and you have your equations of motion, just as you would if you had gone through, drawn a free body diagram, and figured out what the forces were. So now to go to a crazy example, because uh, I just want to show you how powerful Lagrangian mechanics can be and how little thought you actually have to put into it. Here's a problem that I've had to solve in like three or four of my classes, because it's just so, it's, it's terrible if you try to use Newtonian mechanics on it, but it's, it's a breeze if you use Lagrangian. So the idea is, you've got this ring on the ground. So imagine a quarter that's sitting on the ground and you spun it. So it's a spinning quarter basically on the ground. And it's not just a quarter, it's a hoop. So you've got this hoop, and inside the hoop is a mass that's free to rotate about the ring. So the ring itself is spinning with uh, angular velocity big omega, and then the mass is free to rotate around the hoop itself as well. That seems terrible. I don't want to draw a free body diagram. I don't want to work out the forces. I really don't want to solve this, but with Lagrangian mechanics, it makes it so much easier. First, you have to figure out what the kinetic energy would be, and the potential energy, and then nothing. Just Then you, at that point, can just use the Euler-Lagrange equation and get the solution. The kinetic energy of the mass itself just going around the stationary ring is going to be 1 half m r squared theta dot squared, where theta is the angle that the mass subtends from the ground. Then you also have to in, add up the second kinetic energy due to the mass spinning around due to the loop spinning. And that kinetic energy would just be 1 half m times the effective radius, which would be r squared sine squared theta, you can work that out yourself, times the uh, angular velocity of that moving in that direction squared. The potential energy, uh, you can find for yourself just using some math and thinking real hard about this, but I'll just tell you it's mgr1 minus cosine theta because we want it to be zero when the mass is at the bottom and we want the effective radius to be two when uh, theta is equal to pi, which would give us two mgr. So that gives us the full Lagrangian. So we add up both of these kinetic energies into one full kinetic energy, subtract the potential energy, we get this beautiful creature here, this Lagrangian, this gigantic monster. And all we have to do at this point is just plug the Lagrangian, this thing, into uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation, and we'll get our differential equation for the motion of this system. And it's that straightforward. At this point, it would just be taking the partial derivatives and then setting them equal to each other. So with that, that's uh, just an extremely general overview of what Lagrangian mechanics is and how to use it. So you're welcome to look more into it. I highly encourage you to do so. So another wonderful thing about Lagrangian mechanics is that you get to something called Noether's Theorem, which is a wonderful principle that comes from abstract algebra that uh, tells us how to derive conservation laws. You know, conservation of energy, angular momentum, linear momentum. That all comes from symmetries within your system. And whenever you use Lagrangian mechanics, you can find things called cyclic coordinates and just find symmetries through your system with Lagrangians and you can derive things like conservation of energy, linear momentum, angular momentum. Maybe I'll have some videos later on that, uh, but thanks for watching.